we started recording officially. Andrew. Can you all see the agenda for the meeting? Uh, yes, we can see you. Awesome. And uh, so our agenda today is labs experiments that allow students to collect data at home. And our host is Kendra Sibertson from, from Metropolitan Community College in Nebraska. And Kendra is already here, our co-host, and she's waiting. And I'm here going to be the police administrative managing <laughs> getting people in because of the terrible <laughs> bombings. Um, <clears throat> And um, I just want to do some quick housekeeping here before we go on. And the first housekeeping I would like to do is, I will quickly repeat this at the end. Uh, let me go here to this site. So this is the site of the, uh, where we are posting the, all that we shared in the previous Zoom meetings, okay? So hopefully- Glenda, are you sharing that right now? Yeah, I'm sharing this. Okay. Can you see my screen? I see you, but let me try. I'll just click around and see. I got it. Thank you. Oh, great. So hopefully you can see this website that the resources sharing during the Zoom meetings. Can you all see that in general? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you for okay. sharing okay. that. And um, so here there are some guidelines. If you want to, as more people are, ha people are having more time now to prepare labs, etc. many of us have been keeping all the materials and able to make them nice. So if you'd like to share the labs that you have, their videos, etc. now, you can do that. Send me an email. But it would be nice to sort of have a structure that could create some kind of readme file. One of you has a microphone that's pretty loud, so, so I'm going to have to, hold on a second, guys. I'm going to help everyone here. There's quite a few admits here, and I haven't been a good police now. I'm going to mute everyone just for now so that I can speak. Uh, so uh, this is the website and please then produce a readme file explaining what your file is all about and send me the file. So it's in here. All right. Um, uh, the next thing I would like to say, so uh, hopefully you can all see the screen. This is our agenda, uh, how to develop inquiry-based labs, how to get students to take data with things and items they can easily find at home, how to get students to take data with cell phone apps and sensors. Everyone is invited to share when we get to that part, but uh, we might have too many, a, a lot of participants. Right now we already have 34, 35, and there might be more. So uh, the, if you can share with just a few words and type in in the uh, bo chat box, if there is any kind of app, website, link you would like to share, just type it in there and we'll post that for, for everyone later, okay? That might be easier if, you, if there isn't enough time to share uh, verbally, orally. Um, just, to, just to give already a heads up, next week is about assessments. Kendra you can take over and share your screen. You should be able to share your screen and okay. uh, kidnap it from me. Okay, <laughs> you want to ask the poll questions first? Yes, yeah, very good, thank you, Kendra. So I have a few poll uh, questions for all of you. I'll launch the, very, the first one here. So the first question is, um, what type of data collection, if any, are you using while remote teaching, teaching remotely? And choose as many uh, options down here as they apply to you, okay? So please answer that poll and uh, participate and check whichever answers are the best for you. If your option is other, we would like you to very, very briefly, please just let us know, oh, I use this yes, instead. Answer. that instead. So hold on, we are still taking the poll. 20 people out of 33 have answered, so we're waiting. Okay. 
So uh, many people are using simulation. So far, it seems that most of you are using your, um, your the solution has been to use simulations uh, for students, all the many available, right, from Compadre, etc., to collect data. All right, 29 out of 35 people have answered this poll. The poll is launched. I'm going to end the poll and I will share the results with all of you. So um, it seems that most of you are using the simulations. Hopefully you can all see that um, uh, the next uh, uh, largest uh, uh, option here is the students use data that was previously connected, collected. Many of us are doing that. Some of us had time just before to record videos. And, and so students can interact with the video a little bit. Maybe you gave part of the values, but uh, some of the other values they can get from videos. So far, as from my experience, we are doing all the same. We are in very similar simu simulation. So I'm going to situation. I'm gonna go share a second poll here with you. Um, so let's see the other poll. So this is about paid services. So we wanna know now, what did you do before the quarantine, before COVID? Before COVID, were you using any paid service to do the labs? Please answer the poll. Please answer the poll. Hey, Glenda, if we wrote our own labs, would we just pick the first one? So you, you, oh boy, there's an option at the end, other. Oh, okay, sorry. So, so you can you can choose that, and um, I didn't even allow you the previous from the previous poll for you guys to give me input, but I'll I'll, I'll ask your input right now. So, so let's finish this poll here. We have 20 people out of 41. Okay, so by far most are using by far well. All right, a lot of public resources, a lot of Logger Pro. 33 out of the 41 have taken the poll, 34. Let's go, guys. <laughs> All right, okay, so we're gonna end the poll and share the results. So here you go. So a lot of public resources and, um, and a lot of Logger Pro because, you know, it's one license for the, the whole community. So your students mostly. We are mostly talking about community college. I bet your students mostly you didn't have to get your students to pay anything. So the question now is about after COVID, because I, I bet many of us are thinking differently after COVID. So it's sort of the same options, but now I'm asking you, what are you thinking to, that you're planning to do for the summer? And uh, what would you like to yet incorporate this semester or for the summer as a more permanent solution? So please answer this poll for the future. So may, maybe instead of using public resources, maybe you are now considering I'm going to get them to pay more for certain things. Let me know what are your plans. Okay, so it seems that for the future, after COVID and even the summer and the future, people plan, there's more lab kit ideas and rely even more on free resources. I guess people are finding even more about free resources. Uh, we got 34 people answering here. Okay, I think we are good to almost finish this. Poll. All right, so those who responded others, other in the, in the option of labs here for the paid labs, can you very briefly let us know what are the other solutions that you're finding? I guess that he already said, I write my own lab report, my, my own labs, right? So I'm gonna end the poll and share. Theo, that, that's the other for you? Yeah, so we, we, use, uh, we use some of the Vernier sensor equipment, but you know, we write our own labs. Some of the labs may be similar to Vernier, just depending on when they were written and some, some are just, I got from the two year college workshop that I sort of changed to use at our school. Totally. And anybody else who responded other in the, um... Yeah, I, uh, Terry Woodward, uh, UW Oshkosh Fond campus. Um, 
Go I write, and... I've written my own labs for, for years. And then when COVID hit, I assembled my own lab kits from equipment lying around the lab that I wouldn't be heartbroken if I never got back again. Uh, and some real simple stuff I just donated myself uh, rather than try to find a commercial kit. Wow. Okay. Wow. Uh, just mostly use my own um, labs that I've written and um, I use the FETs. Okay. So a lot of, okay, a lot of simulations public and but based on a lot of that you wrote. All right, and um, anybody else have responded other in any of these three polls that would like to share? Um, something that was not in any of the other alternatives here you would like to share? No? Okay, Kendra, take it over. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Yeah, yes. Okay, you can hear me okay? All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and go through and uh, mention a few things. I've been doing some online physics labs for a while. Uh, tell you about my first semester algebra based physics, what I do for that for my students at home. And then I'll also mention some of the things that I've been doing since. Uh, we've been staying at home and students will be doing some online stuff. So that is more of a calculus based physics to, uh, you know, kind of the end of the, the term here. What I've, what I've done, what I plan on doing and uh, some, some ideas that I have. All right. So uh, after that, if you have some questions, I can clarify some things. Otherwise, I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly. All right, so about mm, quite a few years ago, I was looking at my physics labs. I was not satisfied with the traditional physics labs in terms of inquiry-based activities, because you go and you look at all of the, the research, and if you're doing articulation agreements and everything, it always talks about inquiry-based activities where students ask scientific questions. But I found that most of the cookie cutter uh, labs had very formulaic, you know, this is the question you ask, this is the, the method that you're gonna use to solve it, tell me what the number is. And it doesn't allow students to ask questions. And, you know, kind of philosophically, if you think about it, when did you start asking scientific questions, real scientific questions on your own? Uh, you know, maybe even as a graduate student, you were doing somebody else's research and you were answering their scientific question. So getting students to ask a scientific question is uh, challenging, but it's not impossible. So I started with that. And what I'm showing you is kind of the end of every lab that I do, students have to design uh, a question, pursue the evidence, analyze it, come to a conclusion. So. This is your task, design an answerable research question, you know, collect the data, find the evidence about an aspect of blank that you have not completed before. So if you do not give students some background, if you do not teach them how to ask a good question, they are going to blank on you like deer caught in the headlights. Uh, they will have no idea. You can say, oh, you can ask any question, you can use any materials they'll have no clue. So you kind of have to build them up to a point where they can ask kind of an interesting question, but a doable question. And uh, so at the end of every lab, I want to get to that point. So I generally have some activities that they do at the beginning that are very hand-holding, you know, download this, click this, see how this works. And then it kind of view, lets them view some questions. And then at the very end, they can ask their own questions. So uh, kind of how do I get students to ask good scientific questions? You have to show them how to ask good scientific questions. Give them lots of examples in the, in the activities lead, leading up. And tell them it's OK to ask the simple question. Because especially in the beginning, I've had students say, well, what question do you want me to ask? 
I'm like, well, that's not the point. <laughs> you have to ask your own question. And then they'll say, but I don't know if it's a good enough question. It doesn't have to be a good enough question. It has to be a question that you can answer that's kind of interesting that you can take data and analyze. So it's okay to ask the simple question. And it's okay to take one of the previous questions that I showed you, change it a little bit, and make a new scientific question. You're looking at maybe a different aspect of the thing that we're studying. I would say a handful of students will come up with that scientific question section and say, uh, you drive a car off a cliff at 40 miles an hour, the cliff is this high, where does it land? And then, so basically they make up a homework question and they solve it. And I have to go back and tell them, you know, that's not what I'm looking for in the lab. This, this is a valuable skill and I want you to know how to solve problems, but I want you to do something that you can measure at home. So unless you drive a car off a cliff and no, don't drive a car off a cliff, you know, maybe roll a ball off a table and measure that instead of driving a car off a cliff. Uh, instead of dropping a ball from a 10 story building, drop it from shoulder height. You know, something that you can measure, something that you can analyze. And it doesn't have to win a Nobel Prize or anything. And then I found that introductory physics students are always scared of failure. Uh, I'm, I'm scared I'm gonna fail. Well, that's kind of what science is about. And when you fail, when you end up with an answer that you didn't expect, that's when the learning happens. That's, that's kind of the sweet spot is that you're, you're, that's the magic. You're learning what you didn't know before. And that's what I'm looking for. And I will say, if, if doing this and then kind of uh, coaching them on how to ask good questions, by week three, they don't have any more troubles. And then we're good for the rest of the term. So with this inquiry-based research, um, uh, halfway through the term, I have them communicate the results. I do a discussion and it's easy because they've already done the labs. I'll say, pick your favorite one that you did, share it with everybody else. They get to see a bunch more good questions that other people have asked and then they can analyze their data. I give them a, an evaluation rubric and I'll say, uh, you know, did they answer their question? Did they have good enough evidence to support their conclusion? Did they uh, you know, is there enough data there to, to handle what, the, what, they, what they figured? And I do that at the end of the term as well. And uh, how many labs do you do in a semester? Um, about 15. Okay. So I, I'm going to go ahead and tell you Thank which you. labs I do uh, the, the first semester algebra-based physics. So it's, you know, 15 weeks, like 15, 16 week uh, semester we're actually on the quarter system but I've gotten it into like a 15 week thing and when I go into it and I say all right I'm gonna have you do labs but you're gonna be doing them at home so I don't know what you have at home but I need you to find a way to measure distance okay not everybody has a yardstick maybe some people have a meter stick some people can go in the garage and get a tape measure if you don't even have a ruler you can look online and print off a ruler if you have a printer in your house um, or if you have a sheet of paper, you know a sheet of paper is eight and a half by 11. So you Work can- Work at PCC? What's no, that? This is, uh, this is oh, okay. Uh, so the other thing that you have to do- physics? Yeah. Oh, okay. Find a way to measure time. So- Is that that's her talking? Way. Can't see your face. Um, it's skipping. No. Hi. Oh, no, that's <laughs> uh, 15 minutes, 18, we would like you to mute your microphone so that the presenter can- <clears throat> giving the talk please thank you okay so time is the easiest one everybody has a cell phone oh, okay. they can use the stopwatch to measure the uh, well, this is nationwide. Oh. the the toughest ones are going to be a way to measure weight so some people have a postal scale or a food scale at home uh usually the bathroom scale doesn't measure small enough uh you know number of pounds or whatever for small things so uh, an alternative is like if we're doing a pendulum lab and students need to use mass, I'll just say, go find a bunch of the same thing, like a bunch of washers. So then I'll be one, two, three, four, five, or 10 washers. And you know, it's like a different unit, but it, you're able to, to quantify it. And that's what I'm looking for is for them to ask questions and quantify things. All right, and then the other hard one is not everybody has a thermometer but um, they, they can usually find a candy thermometer, meat thermometer in the kitchen, medical thermometer, um, or borrow one, you know, so 
I, I'm pretty open and I'm okay for alternative methods of doing things. And that kind of lends students to, um, you know, find their creativity and then they, they kind of feel a pride in that, figuring out something at home. So you're, you're giving up some control here. You're not, uh, you don't have the exact equipment in the lab that they would have done in the lab, but they're having to figure it out on their own. Okay, and as far as the apps go, um, I, I just have a few apps in the algebra-based physics. And I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make every app that I used either free uh, and multi-platform. So on the iOS as well as Android system. And, and for the most part, um, I've been pretty good at that. But the one that I can't really uh, fault is the, the video physics from Vernier. And it's $4.99. And actually now you might be able to get a trial version, I'm not sure, but that lasts us the whole time. And it's super easy to use. I will tell students, you know, just find a video uh, analysis program. This is a really good one, video physics. I would spend the 4.99 on it. But they, I've had a few students download Tracker. I think it's got more of a learning curve, but you know, I, I kind of want to leave it up to them. So I will go ahead and share with you what I do for each of the weeks for the lab for the online class. Uh, the first week, they download a video analysis program, preferably the video physics because it's so easy to use. Uh, learn how to record a screenshot so that you can show me what you're doing from your phone or your iPad or your uh, computer. Find some conversion resources uh, from different units and find a graphing program. So our students have access to the Microsoft Suite, uh, Word, and Excel. So I know they have access to Excel, but if they find something else that works better, great. Um, week two, constant velocity. So I, I asked them a bunch of questions about rate and speed and calculating things. And then their question, the question that they come up with most often is how fast does blank go? So I want them to ask a question about constant velocity. And like I said, you kind of have to give up control here because they might not ask the question that you want them to ask, but they're asking their question. So they're making it more personal because it's like, how fast does my dog run? And then they video it and they analyze it and they're making it very personalized. I've had a student you know, who just had a new baby and the baby is crawling. How fast does my baby crawl towards that toy? And it really you know, kind of personalizes it a lot that we wouldn't have in the physics lab on campus. Or my son got a new bike. How fast does my, my kid on the bike go? All right, so just real simple, you know, basic into uh, analysis of the videos. Week three, accelerated motion, speeding up, slowing down. Uh, most common thing is going to be just dropping something. Uh, but they might throw in their own questions like the with friction. And then I, I might suggest like the coffee filters or, you know, if they get to that point. But I basically want them to figure uh, a question out on their own and then uh, de you know, analyze it themselves. Okay, week four, projectile motion. So you have the two dimensions. If you take a video from the side, you can split it up into the X and Y components. Um, actually, let me go ahead and show you here. I wrote a blog like five years ago on some video, uh, some physics apps. And this was a video that I took of my sons. My sons are in the video are in middle school and uh, they're seniors this year. So their graduation was canceled because of all of our quarantining and everything. So I look at this video and it makes me a little sad, but uh, we just came home from school one day. I said, hey, throw this ball. And it took me one minute and that includes the two times that they dropped it. <laughs> so it was like two <laughs> seconds uh, to get this video. I just got the points on the ball there and you it go ahead, it, it um, shows you the component. I had to um, specify the height so I knew how tall my kid was. So that gives me the, the distance on the graph. And then I got a nice little parabola there. And it will show you uh, the velocity components as well, x velocity and y velocity. So this is my y velocity. And it, you know, it's maybe a little bumpy, but you know, it's fairly linear and I could, uh, show the students how to figure out acceleration from that. And you can even play with a motion diagram with that by the looks of it. Yeah. Yep. That was uh, video physics that you were using? Yeah, it's an app, video physics from Vernier. 
and it's it's excellent um really intuitive easy to use they have some videos already in there that students could use if they didn't want to make their own but i know that it's really important for students to you know take their own videos and analyze their own data so week five i do uh a force lab with thrust with balloons different size balloons different shape balloons and then they can ask questions about that uh, week six is uh, centripetal force week seven work and energy week eight is collisions and if they if they have the video physics you know i say well take a couple matchstick cars if you're if your kids have little matchstick cars or two balls or billiard balls or whatever you can find so it's them doing science at home it's them finding physics to do at home and uh, the rest of the year, or the rest of the semester anyway, angular motion, I, I have them do some preliminary uh, angular motion things. And then the most common question is, how fast does that thing spin? So it can be, they go out and they see one of those wind turbines, and then you know they can approximate the size of it and figure out how fast, how long it takes to go around. I had one student who figured out how fast her her laundry went around, you know, so in the washing machine, they followed one shirt to determine how fast it went. Uh, what I actually do is I have them take a, a hard boiled egg and a, an uncooked egg and have spin them and see if there's any difference in how, how fast they can spin it. You know, so real simple sorts of things that they have at home that they can analyze and then they can start thinking about things. Uh, week 11 is the pendulum experiment, uh, you know, classic. What, what I want them to get to ask is, you know, how does the time of one swing of a pendulum depend on mass, length, how far you pull it back? Uh, so, so I make them do three uh, variables, keeping everything else the same, and then maybe one more if you can come up with it. And so most students don't come up with another one, but they can ask like, what if I used a rubber band instead of a, a string? What if I used thick rope instead of thin rope? What if I you know, had a pendulum on a pendulum. So they, they can come up with some really interesting things, but they might not all be fruitful and they might not all be the exact thing that you would have studied if you were in the physics lab. Um, week 12 is sound. I uh, wrote a bottle resonance lab and my students just love this. So I say, take a, a soda bottle or a ketchup bottle, empty, fill it with water. Um, I use the frequency counter, Freak Counter. It's a free app and it's just to analyze uh, sound. So um, actually, yeah, I can- Negu. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'll just show you here the frequency counter. You make a, a, a tone and you can stop it. There's a little fast Fourier transform uh, button down here. You hit that and it tells you what the most common frequency is in that sound. So if it's a complex sound, um, you can maybe be looking at some of the peaks, maybe you get some harmonics here, uh, some of those resonances. And so if students have musical instruments at home, they can maybe ask a question about that. Um, but yeah, they love that. So, you know, then they'll ask, does the length, uh, like the height of how much water you have in there, like the volume of the water make a difference? Does it matter what the material is? What if I try milk instead of water? If there's different densities, uh, it, if I had a thin bottle versus a thick bottle, like the diameter, does that make a difference in the sound? Uh, does temperature make a difference? They'll shove it in the oven, or well, hopefully not the oven too hot, but the refrigerator or the freezer. And you know, it's, it's about them being at home and, and taking measurements uh, with materials that they have. All right, so some traditional Archimedes principle, uh, heat capacity if they have a thermometer, and I will say week 15, I have a free choice lab. I'll tell them, maybe you did a study earlier on and you wanted to do something a little better or a little different, you can do that. Um, but at, at about this point, about half of them are done. <laughs> they are done with physics, so they do like a really simple thing. But about half of them come up with some really clever, really interesting scientific uh, questions that they, that they solve with materials at home. Okay, um, let me go ahead and mention a few things uh, about the calculus-based physics. So I did algebra-based physics online, and most of the students that take that class are students that work full-time. It's a lot of students who are nurses who are going back to 
medical school to become a doctor and they have to do the MCATs and so they or they have to take this physics class. So we're talking about some pretty dedicated, um, you know, and they're they're willing to do the work, but they just can't come into the physics class at during the day or or whenever it's offered. Uh, they have families, they have kids. So this the students that that stick with the online physics and it's not easy. It's it's tough because they have to take more responsibility for their own learning. Uh, the the ones who do it and they they do it well and and they're really successful with it. But when I was developing this. Physics two, we just didn't have the same need for. We don't get as many algebra-based physics two students as we do one because of the requirements. So we just didn't have a need to try and put it online. So I didn't, because it was hard. <laughs> it was harder to do circuits and optics in, in the home environment. But that's what I'm doing now, I guess. So where we were at, we went through five weeks in class, in lab, and um, week six, uh, you know, we started our, our stay at home. So I, if we were in class, I would have done the circuits, uh, resistors and series in parallel. And I rewrote it so that they would use the DC circuit builder. And that worked great. Uh, I didn't need them to hook the resistors up in series in parallel because we did it the week before in class. And I'm confident that they understood how to use a voltmeter, use a multimeter as a voltmeter, how to use a multimeter as an ammeter and not blow the fuse out on it, how to set it up correctly. So this was just focusing more on what happens to the current and the voltage through each of these resistors uh, when you set them up in different ways. So I was really thrilled with how the students did on that. And I'm sure it was super fast because it's easy to manipulate the, the simulators. Uh, the next week, uh, week seven, was, I was going to do RC circuits. So the RC circuits, we have these PASCO uh, developed ones, and it's, it's a nice little lab. It's super easy. It's quick, but they couldn't do it in lab. So what I did was um, I brought, brought it home and I took a video. So I'll play you the video. I, I gave them the capacitor. Um, how many microfarads that was. I told them what the resistance of the resistor was. And then now they have a video. It's, it's only like a couple minutes long. They have timestamps there. So I had them go and measure the voltage at whatever times, you know, like every two seconds or five seconds. And then they um, graphed that. Well, they, they took the natural log and graphed it. So the, the main point of this, I really wanted them to understand how to manipulate uh, an exponential. This is an exponential decay of your RC circuit. So I did that and the students did great with that. That worked out really well. So this last week uh, was magnetic fields. If we were in class, I would have done the uh, putting current through a slinky and using my magnetic field sensors to measure the magnetic field at the center of a slinky. And I love that lab, but they're not going to have slinkies. They're not going to have power supplies. So I just made it super simple. I said, find an app uh, that measures, that, that uses the magnetic field sensor in your phone. So um, yeah, for the magnetic fields, I said, it was really simple. I said, find a magnetic field app that uses your, your cell phone and um, measure something. <laughs> so do an experiment with the magnetic fields. And most of the students um, did a pretty good job with this. Uh, they, some found another magnetic field uh, app, and this is what it looks like. This is a student's data. Uh, most of them measured the strength of the magnetic field of the earth. Uh, some did some refrigerator magnets, some did some computer uh, equipment to see what the magnetic fields were there. And I had one student who made an electromagnet and measured the magnetic field near it, different voltages. And so this is what it, the standard is. And it's this X, Y, and Z. And they said the most difficult part of that was showing the, was interpreting this graph. Uh, if you go into the settings, you can change it to just the magnitude of it, the magnetic field. And that's maybe easier to understand, but it can be broken out into the X, Y, and Z components. So you don't need an attachment to the iPhone. All you need is the app itself, and it can detect a magnetic field. Yes. 
Yep. Every um, iPhone has a magnetic field sensor that uses the, the uh, compass, you know, to be able to tell north. A lot of astronomy apps use that to determine orientation uh, so that you can tell which constellation you're looking at in the night sky. And uh, it was also available for Android. So I'm pretty okay. sure that most phones have that. And that's another thing that I'm really interested in doing is allowing students to use the, the tools that they have at home. And within the cell phones, they are so um, advanced and they are so nifty. Like you have an accelerometer in your phone and to be able to take the data from that and use it is really nice. Okay, so um, I usually have the students do a high altitude ballooning flight in the spring, and unfortunately that's been canceled. So uh, instead of doing that, the lab, what I, I am having them do is to analyze data from one of our previous flights. It is uh, not ideal, but they, they get a chance to do some data analysis that way. In week 11, we're starting into optics. So this is where I'm at now is I, I know that the FET bending light app is great and I, I might use that. But I was also thinking about optics. I usually do reflection and refraction. And so they're doing Snell's law and determining the index of refraction of something. And so I, I just kind of had an idea. So this is what I did is I went and I got a glass and fill it with water. And my husband has some green laser pointer that, that he uses for uh, pointing out stars in the night sky for showing constellations. So I, I went into the dark bathroom and shot the, the laser light into the glass. So this line, I had to go in and go from the laser to the, the top of the, the water. So I just used the markup tool. And uh, I thought, you know, I wonder if there's a way to measure angles using an app. So I went and I looked up protractor apps and there was this photo protractor app and I downloaded that and it's pretty easy. You set your, your, uh, the middle of your circle somewhere and you can measure an angle. And I wasn't real careful about this. I just kind of eyeballed where the normal was uh, here and here. And I, I looked at the angles and I calculated it and I got an index of refraction of water to be about 1.37. So I was really happy with that. Uh, what I'm thinking of doing is to just give them this picture and then maybe go in with some vegetable oil and do the same thing and give them that and then tell them to find a protractor app and, or, you know, print one off or if they have one at home, measure it on the screen and to be able to find the index of refraction of the optics. So for the week after that, I'm thinking of lenses and intensity of light. So I saw one lab where you can take some photos and some measurements and determine the focal length of the, the lens in your, in your cell phone. I think that would be really cool. And I like giving students options. So I might do that or I might say, find a light meter app that measures in whatever, lux or intensity um, and do an experiment with it. So the easiest thing to do would be find a point source and then measure the from distance from it and see if it falls off as an inverse square law. Maybe you could do a bank of lights or uh, you know whatever they could come up with. So really simple, really easy tools they have. It uses the the camera on the phone. There's a program called Light Meter that actually I've been using in astronomy to uh, um, gauge uh, light reflection from a sphere to demonstrate spring and summer that's actually pretty cool yeah that would be really awesome and you know the students come up with more things than you can think about you don't know what they have in their home they might have something that's really cool like a light bar that might be pretty interesting and it probably wouldn't drop off if you're really close it's not going to drop off as a an inverse square because it's not a point source so some really interesting things they could do and as far as diffraction and interference, I know there's like a applets or a, the, the FET simulations. I might do something with that, but I also have a bunch of diffraction glasses that I brought home, the paper ones, and uh, for my astronomy lab that I send out. So I might send those to my physics students 
and there's uh you know if they have a pen laser at home like a cat toy i know those are really cheap but i know not everybody has them um, so i can maybe send them some photos and some uh measurements there if they wanted to do that and they didn't have it or they could use the the simulator um, but for spectroscopy if they had that little piece of diffraction grading i mean it's cheap it's like 50 cents a piece and i send those to them they can make a spectrometer out of their cell phone using spectrasnap um, Actually, yeah, in the blog post, um, actually, I think it's in the astronomy version. There's one called SpectraSnap, and it's from the APS, and it shows you how to use, turn your cell phone into a DIY spectrometer, but you have to have a little diffraction grading. So what I do is I have students, and I think this was a spectrum that I took, a compact, compact fluorescent white light, and so you take, uh, a spectrum and then you can analyze it or compare it to other ones. What I'm thinking of doing is saying go find different sources, uh, measure or take pictures of the different spectra and then have them all come together and have a, a composite place for them to all look at their different spectra and see if they can find anything out about it, find what sources look like what and uh, make some analysis there. All right, and then lastly, you know, usually I do a radioactivity lab and I've used radioactive material before and that's a little stressful and it's expensive and, you know, you want to be careful with the students. Um, but then I've also done like a random generator where you take 20 dye and you roll them and then you take out, uh, to, so to simulate half-life, to simulate the, the radioactive particles, you take those out and then you roll the remaining dice. And then uh, you take those out, roll the remaining dice. And so what I ended up doing was uh, I was thinking, well, I know students aren't going to have 20 dice sitting around at home. Uh, maybe they could find one in somebody's games, but or maybe they could make or just some little box. And I'm thinking of die. And then I'm like, you know what? I'll bet there's a random generator. So I looked online and random dice generator, random.org. Uh, yeah, you, you can just roll the dice. So I said, okay, I'm gonna roll 30 dice and it rolled 30 dice. And so you can go back and then change it to like 10 dice. And then, then they graph that and then they are able to analyze half-life a little bit better with the, the radioactivity. So that's where I'm at now. Um, if we wanna open it up and if you have any questions for me or if you wanna talk about some online lab stuff that, that you do. So, hi, this is uh, Maggie Gepper from Harper College. Um, we have, uh, and, and uh, Deb Damecott is also here, and she's the experimental uh, subject. Uh, several of our faculty members over many years have had uh, medical tests using you know, technetium or radioactive iodine, and we collected uh, the activity data for their tests over days. Uh, so we have five different sets of data that we, we call the biological scan lab. <laughs> and, and, and so that's what I'm planning to do for our radioactive lab for my physics three class is just get, we have, you know, it's already a lab that's set up, uh, you know, the date and the students have to make, can make Excel graphs of the data and they can get the half-life for uh, for the technetium and the uh, and the iodine for the for the medical scans and it's a really it's a really really interesting lab because you actually get quite bad results because of the big because the half lives are Deb you correct me if I'm wrong much shorter the experimental half lives uh, is from the data is much shorter because of the you know because of uh, how we how we excrete the uh, the elements. So it's pretty. Uh, it's a it's a really great lab to make them think, and it's especially good for the biological sciences majors because it has that um, connection to medical scans. Yeah, you have to get not only the experimental theoretical half life, you get a biological half life out of it too. I did something similar when I had, I had to take radioactive iodine over Christmas break one time and I borrowed a Geiger counter to measure my radioactivity levels over that couple of weeks. And 
I think radioactive iodine is like seven or 10 days, but I was half lifing at 20 hours. So yeah, there's a lot more to it than just the, the material itself. Anybody else? I, yes. Go oh, ahead. Uh, I'm also. I'm also. Uh, this is something that I, I. I was already talking to Glenda about. I am uh, sending her, and I'll send the biological scan lab also. Uh, my physics three class. Uh, I just took data yesterday for our Planck's constant, uh, determining Planck's constant using LEDs lab. So uh, what the students do is they find the. Um, they find the threshold voltage of a, of a bunch of different colors of LEDs, and then you can graph that threshold voltage versus one over the wavelength. And from, basically, uh, out pops Planck's constant from the, from the, uh, from the data. So I, uh, I t usually we have our students measure, uh, use the vernier light sensors to measure the uh, brightness, so at, you know, to measure when the LEDs turn on, and at the same time, they're also using the voltage probe to measure the voltage, and so you can, they can grab the uh, threshold voltage from the turn on time, and so I made uh, logger profiles, like eight different logger profiles for the students to look at, uh, find those threshold voltages, and then they can, um, and then then they can use that data, all those different logger profiles. So those will be, those, I'll be sending those to Glenda this afternoon to share with everyone. So I can also send the uh, biological scan assignment for anybody who wants that. Oh, that's great. On, on, on this hook, let me just highlight this to you all, that if you would like to share any of your lab materials, uh, you can just send me that uh, via email, but it would be nice if you could produce a readme file because normally you send a lot of files, say here is the video analysis, here's the PDF, here's this and that. So if you can produce sort of a readme file explaining what every file is all about, a short description, that would be good and I'll post here. So you have already a few shared labs. Uh, Toby, the lab about draining bucket is here. So they will look like this. You click here and you're just going to go to your Google, uh, Google Drive and there are PDFs and there's a readme file, which is with Toby's email in this case. If you want to produce anything else, Toby, send it to me. So there are some labs over here. These are some of the ones I created and I posted online here, etc. Uh, but uh, other people, Andrew Young, you did several here. You, you shared your Google Drives. I posted there as well. So anybody who would like to, of course, it would be, if you can, post your material somewhere already, like a Google Drive and just send the link. That's better because we have limited space over here. And the other uh, thing I would like to highlight is, Kendra, you know, you were using the Vernier Lab, uh, the Vernier video uh, for video analysis, the Vernier app. And I use Mac, right? I use Mac a lot. And with the, the, the Catalina, the new version of Mac, it broke video analysis on Vernier. So I, I do have to use Tracker. So, and sometimes I would like to use Logger Pro to do the video analysis and it's broken now. They will release a new um, updated version for Logger Pro uh, for Mac for compatibility to do video analysis only in a couple of weeks, they said. So, so far only the video app really for people who use Mac so if a student has a Mac only a computer, uh, won't be able to do Logger Pro video analysis nowadays. So they need the video app. By the way, I also, there's a form online where you can get that app. Instead of paying $4.99, you can require, request it to be free for you. But I guess there's a lot of demand because I haven't got any answer in a week. <laughs> I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, Kendra, I mean, when you're doing your video analysis, uh, I know when I've done video analysis with my students, uh, they usually sometimes get some, uh, like the, if they're trying to calculate the value of G, they can get a, a, a huge value just based on the scaling issues. Have you encountered those things in, in your video analysis uh, labs? So, you know, a part of them having asking the questions and trying to figure out the best way to measure things is kind of fine tuning those uh, how you take the data to get good numbers. And so, you know, like 
I, I am hesitant to direct them too much in the beginning because I want them to make their own mistakes and figure things out. So they're going to figure out, I, I might say, you know, it's really important for the, the object to go from left to right across the screen because if the dog is bringing you back a toy, we're not going to be able to get the, the velocity measurement very well, you know, towards and away. So, uh, you know, I might say something like the, the best way is going to be so that it's perpendicular to the, or, you know, going, going across the screen and you have to, to do a measurement that you know what the distance is at wh whatever it is. Like if, if it's the ball, you need to know the, the accurate diameter of the ball in order to get good values out of that or the, the correct height of the kid. If you approximate, then that's going to blow your numbers up. But you know that's kind of uh, an important thing when you're talking about error in a lab, or you know what kind of measurements you're taking, what kind of tools you're using, how precise are your your values going to be? I think that's an important conversation to to have rather than you know dictate to them you know you have to do it this way so that you get good numbers. I I kind of want them to get bad numbers sometimes and try and figure out why. You know, so it, it's always kind of a dance. You don't want them to get too frustrated with getting bad numbers, but you want them to to struggle enough that they learn and understand and and can do better. Does that Firefox do everything that the Vernier uh, video physics does? I've I've had a lot of pushback because I've you know we have community college students and money's an issue for them, and just spending four ninety nine, I've gotten a lot of pushback in the past. I don't know. I, I just looked at the Firefox for the magnetic field sensor because it seemed like the easiest one. I haven't done any. I don't know that it has like a video analysis sort of a thing um, that's comparable, but the, the format, uh, you know, it all looks really nice. The interface. I, so I didn't play around with any of the other sensors there. So I can't speak to that. But I know the magnetic field sensor was pretty simple. Um, and then the, the students figured it out. And, and yeah, I, I agree with you. I go for, for free and easy all day long. You know, and I, I'm loath to spend 99 cents that I don't have to. I will go with the, you know, a cheaper one that doesn't look as nice and has ads in it than pay 99 cents because that's like, because I'm cheapskate and I want my students to have easy access. Do you consider any IO lab in the future maybe uh, to support this online uh, teaching for labs? So what was that again? IO labs, IO lab and the, uh, yep. Uh, I hadn't considered it. Uh -huh. The IO lab is pretty cool. I've been using them uh, on and off in class but their power, I think, is going to be in the uh, using it outside of class with garden variety materials. Kendra, uh, I would like a copy of your PowerPoint slides later. I can if I can post it and also the link for that blog, right? Sure. And, um, yeah, any other material you have, we'll post it. And um, anybody else has any other input of um, apps or ways that they're using uh, to collect data at home? Um, like I said, the one posted by Toby, Toby was doing the draining the bucket at home, uh, recording with Zoom. And so he has the PDFs there. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, Wonderful presentation. You're doing some really cool stuff with your classes. Thanks for sharing. No, oh, you're welcome. I'm happy to share. Kendra, uh, what has been the response from feedback you get from your students? So online or well now, you know, everybody's just in chaos because of everything that's going on. So I, I'm I'm trying to provide a a little bit of ease, uh, you know, nothing horribly complicated. You know, they're they're kind of in a, a mode now where you know they know how to do the homework. They they uh, can do the lab experiments. I, I try and make it so that it doesn't require too much time. They can do it any time they want. 
Um, so yeah, I think we're just trying to get to the end of the year this this time. But when I do the online algebra-based physics, it, it, it's tough because you get some students, it's like any algebra-based physics class, you get, uh, well, I get a die off at week three. You know, uh, background stuff, fine. Constant motion, fine. Accelerated motion, all right. You throw in projectile motion, you know, the X and the Y and the two equations at once and they hit a brick wall. And so you get a bunch of students who uh, just drop at that point. With the online, it's, it's you know, not great. You get, you get a drop off about week three, but the students who stay in it, um, like I said, mostly those are medical students or pre-med and they have other jobs. They can't make it to another physics class and they really appreciate having the flexibility of doing it at home. Um, so they're the ones who are more hesitant to ask you questions if they're struggling. So, you know, there's that push and pull there. But for the most part, by the time they get it, they, they get it and they do a great job with it. So the ones who make it through do really well. But I think Thanks. that's true for a lot of online classes. Thank you. That's great, I think. Gary had a question about Google Sheets, if anybody's using Google Sheets in their lab so that he can see the progress of the students that they, they share and complete the Google Sheets already. I don't do that. I only want to know the final product. <laughs> but um, so I don't look at their Excel spreadsheets most of the time. I don't know if others do. All right, 358. Um, Thank you everybody for coming in. Uh, I don't know about you, but this was a treat. This was a treat for me. And uh, thank you so much, Kendra. And um, is Chris, uh, is Chris Louie here? Chris? Yep, I'm here. Hi, yep. right, Chris. So next week, uh, outside of the box, thinking about assessments, right? Uh, so yes. That's it, with everybody's collaboration. And we'll be posting more about that soon. And um, um, let me tell you something. We've been, uh, we were just uh, brainstorming with Kendra at the end. So Kendra has a lot of material for astronomy as well. And I was brainstorming with her that I feel like the astronomy community uh, of I mean, community colleges, the, uh, the astronomy teachers are a little bit more isolated even than the physics. And whether it would be good to break this down into a community for astronomy and, and have some Zoom meeting only on astronomy. Uh, uh, tools and and labs and etc. Yeah, so we're thinking of something yeah, like that. Absolutely. And if you're interested, if you if you have things to present, and if you're really interested on this astronomy group, um, send me an email. Let me know, uh, and then we can already prepare like themes and break down the group and have more or less ideas uh, uh, so that we we can get this to be successful. And. Uh, um we got a NASA grant here at Portland Community College to create online labs for our astronomy sequence. Three quarters, we have 30 wonderful astronomy labs ready to go. And I shared them with, uh, with some people, but I haven't, I guess, shared them with you. So I have all 30, and so I can try. It's a huge file, so I, I don't know how to get it onto your storage area there, but uh, it, we'll figure that out. Okay. Google Drive if possible. <laughs> so so okay, we'll see that we'll see that soon. But uh, probably we need to 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 get some uh, reinforcements concerning astronomy. I feel that the astronomers are more isolated. And um, yep. All right. Um, I've been in touch with the chairs of the other committees, and um, I I honestly think that everybody's too backed up and too busy. Um, I didn't hear anything back and this has been more than a week. So I guess it will take a while for everybody to have more time to, to catch up to this. Uh, APT has posted the Zoom meeting this week. They've been asking to advertise it for, for the whole community. Uh, they did it this week, but I think um, the numbers will go back to our 30 or less participants as next week we won't have as much advertisement. <laughs> Well, we're just internal, normal advertisement. Uh, I think advertisement is good, Glenda. 
but then but then it becomes unmanageable if it's a huge crowd. I was, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> but no, no, this was not. This was this was fine. You know, you I don't know. But uh, so let's let's let we have a plan for next week, and then afterwards, uh, if you have ideas, let me know. Basically, we'll try to do labs and tests, labs and tests until uh, until we have other ideas. Yeah. Okay. Linda, have you heard anything about the summer um, meeting? Maybe we oh, no <laughs> no. Um, so um, yeah, I've, I've I've heard of other summer meetings of other institutions that are getting closed while concerning uh, my husband's department and etc. So I don't I, I suspect something it's, we're gonna hear a, a, about it in a couple of weeks. I think in a couple of weeks a lot of things will be more defined. Yeah. Yes, I, I uh, heard a rumor that um, AAPT will be in making some announcements about the summer meeting very soon. So. Yeah. I, I know nothing concrete, no. Yeah. But the next two weeks, I think, will be crucial for, for a lot of meetings and summer meetings, etc., and summer classes. All right. Um, okay, so if you have any ideas, send me emails. Otherwise, the meeting is over. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you. That was wonderful. I'll see you. Thanks, Glenda. Yeah. Thanks, Glenda. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Everyone. Yes, thanks. This was great. Thank you. Where is the leave the meeting In the spot? <laughs> I always I always forget where that is. Bottom right hand. Right hand. Goodness, uh, I can It says I, meeting red, no? I can't see it the leave leave the meeting at all. Let's just stay here. <laughs> I guess Yeah. Glenda, I, I a couple of people wanted those labs and I don't have their email, but uh, uh, the astronomy labs. Yeah, the astronomy labs. I, I like Mel Mela Kabagali. Uh huh. Uh huh. And, so and, I uh, Andrew Young. No, not Andrew Young, but Toby. I told him I'd send them to you, but I, they, I don't send me the big files. You, you where are these files? Are in your computer? Is there? Yeah, a, I, uh, it, it was me asking you. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. So I got you emails. So I'm emailing you so you can send it to my email. Yeah, right. It's a zip file. It's a, okay. a, a zip okay. a zip file. Yeah, right now I'm just emailing you so you can send it to me. Yeah, okay. Awesome. All right, thank you so much. But also to make it available to everyone, Toby, if you want, um, do you have any Google account, Toby? Or Oh, yeah. Or, oh, you do. So if yeah. you there is something the, the google drive if you can put the zip file in the google drive and share with me the url then then makes our lives easier to do the whole thing yeah and there will be no rejection via email right right i've i i'm uh i i think i can figure out how to send uh put things onto google drive i've i've never i i always have my admin person do that <laughs> you know i know it's easy <laughs> counterintuitive every every new device every new service is counterintuitive the buttons are not where you wanted them to be yeah i know but the, yeah so let me know i can help i can help okay yeah okay so I, we can we can even do a private zoom meeting and we figure this out yeah no problem we'll get it out they're great labs awesome awesome i was able to see where to leave the meeting so i'm good <laughs> Don't leave the meeting, Tony. Don't leave the meeting. <laughs> Very good. Okay, idea. Toby, I, I just sent you the email. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you. Yeah. Milaku. Yeah, Are you guys going to be teaching Milaku, summer? Uh, University of Texas, Odessa. I was going to ask you, your summer labs are online too? Oh, you're asking me? Uh, everyone. Uh, yeah, we, we, for me, we're planning to have online labs in the summer too, but we haven't yet uh, the, the final decision yet. 
but we are thinking about it. I will stop.